The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. They got more than a million votes in last week's election, but only eight members of Team Red will be going to Queen's Park. Does that amount to an existential crisis for the Ontario Liberal Party? We'll ask former candidates and dedicated Liberals tonight about what they see in the party's future. Then, Jay and Jaganathan talks to infectious diseases physician Zane Chagla about why monkeypox is suddenly on the radar. It's Thursday, June the 9th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. You have to go back all the way to the 1940s to find another time when the Ontario Liberals were in as much trouble as they're in right now. Back then, they came third in two of that decade's three elections. And now, nearly three quarters of a century later, they've come third twice in a row. The Liberals are in crisis. Is there an apparent way out? Here, in alphabetical order, are four defeated candidates from the 2022 election. Andrea Barrick, the party's candidate in University Rosedale. Lee Fairclough, the candidate in Etobicoke Lakeshore. Jeff Lehman, the candidate in Barrie, Springwater, Oro, Medante. And Jill Permoli, the candidate in Mississauga Streetsville. And also joining us, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, the current Liberal MP from Beaches East York with perhaps some advice for this group. We are delighted that all of you could join us here in our studio tonight. I gotta say, I'm a little bit excited because this is the first time in two years we've actually had a panel discussion in our studio. Thank you, COVID. So it's great to have real people here. This is exciting. Now we get to the nasty stuff. <laughs> Sheldon, shall we roll this, please? This was election night in the riding of Vaughn Woodbridge, which, of course, did not go the Liberals' way. This is video shot by reporter Sean O'Shea saying it was the smallest, saddest election night crowd he had ever seen. And Sean's been around for a while, and he has seen a few things. I want to start with basically what election night a week ago was like for all of you. And let's go in alphabetical order. Andrea, on election night, did you know you were going to lose? Well, I did because I had the benefit of actually having University Rosedale polls reporting an hour later than everyone else. And so I could see the complete liberal meltdown happen before I got my results. And so what that did is gave me some time to emotionally prepare. Um, but of course, it was disappointing. And not just for me, I mean, I was disappointed for the team. I was disappointed for the province. Uh, felt like unrealized hope. I mean, all the things, mm. all the things. But we had a good party anyway. You had a good we party. We had a good okay. party. We had a great team of volunteers. We had a good time. Lee, you lost by 803 votes. Yeah. That was really close. Yes. How was election was. night for you? Well, it, you know, it was sort of similar. What you sort of had your eye on what was going on more broadly and how quickly that was coming to be. And then, as you say, locally, I mean, I think we started off up in, in the original results and then it kind of moved the other way. And so it was um, a bit of a roller coaster for our team where we were. Um, and it was very, very close. And I think we felt actually a lot of pride about what we'd been able to accomplish. But certainly we would have loved for a different result. Mm. Jeff, I remember election night. We were doing, we were at this table, we were doing results. And at one point in the evening, you and your conservative opponent were two votes apart. Yeah. Out of something like 32,000 cast in that moment. Incredible, yeah. It was incredible. You ended up losing by a few hundred. It was the closest race in the province. Yeah. You and the attorney general. Did you think you were going to win? Uh, I did think we were going to win. We felt the momentum uh, going in. Uh, I had so many young volunteers who were so engaged with it. And you get, you get little hints on the campaign trail that, that, that the support is there. Uh, I think late in the day on election day, we started to realize the turnout was a lot lower than we had hoped. Uh, and that was a troubling sign. And, and obviously, uh, you know, we didn't end up conceding until after midnight. So election night was a long night and, and a painful night. As you've said, uh, winning is better than losing. <laughs> <laughs> and you've experienced both. Uh, now I have, yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Is this your first loss? It, it is. Yeah, uh, winning is definitely better than losing. <laughs> um, but you know what? I, I do feel that, you know, there are losses and there are losses. And this was a, a campaign to be intensely proud of. I have people who I think are going to work with me for the rest of, of my life or my public life. Um, and uh, look, I mean, it was a very difficult riding, um, but we ran a campaign to be proud of. So I, I do look back on it with pride. Mm -hmm. Jill, election night for you. 
So uh, by the end of the day, on election day, um, yeah, I, going into 9 o'clock, I, I really did feel that we were not going to be successful. But going into election morning, um, you know, the numbers did look like they were there for us. There had been some polling a couple days ahead of time that told us that we were quite significantly up. Uh, we had a lot of enthusiasm in our community. We had a massive number of sign requests. We had people driving around with my literature taped in their car windows. It was kind of unbelievable. Um, but there was just something that sort of changed in that last couple days where... Um, you could feel it, and you could feel it when you went to the doors to go pull vote, and there was just sort of this uh, resignation that people sort of understood where the province was going to be going, and it was really hard to get people to, to go out and cast those votes. Do you take any satisfaction from the fact that liberals all over the province were coming third, and you came a very strong second in your writing? Uh, no, because I wish that we came first <laughs> in a lot of ridings. Um, honestly, like for me, it was it was never personal, right? I didn't run because I wanted a title. Um, I ran because, uh, you know, my family has been so affected by provincial policy through the years, and I wanted to see a government that was going to better respond to what the people of this province do need, and uh, and that could only be achieved if we had a change on on June second, and it didn't come around. So. Um, for me, it was it was disappointing to see what happened right across Ontario. So I, I wish that we had been able to be more successful in Mississauga Streetsville, but right across Ontario too. Nate, you have a reputation for being a very plain-spoken, independent-thinking member of Parliament, and I'm going to test that right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Prime Minister did nothing for his provincial cousins during the course of this election campaign. Now, Prime Ministers rarely do anyway. But he did do one event after signs started going up, and it was with Doug Ford in southwestern Ontario. What did you think of all that? Well, I, and I think this view is shared by some colleagues as well, there was frustration about late announcements in partnership with the Premier because we certainly wanted to be supportive of our provincial colleagues and, and certainly not undermine them. And, yeah, we would have liked to have seen the Prime Minister and others be much more vocal in the support of our provincial efforts. And I can I can tell you that it, it matters because in my riding we had an incredible candidate in Mary Margaret McMahon. And she and won. She won. And we went all out for her. And, and I and I think that helped. Hmm. Would you have wanted Andrea, the Prime Minister, to come to your riding and campaign with you? Uh, you know, that's a tricky one. Uh, of course, support of any kind is valued. And, mm. and Christian Freeland came out and campus with me, which was mm. lovely of her to do. Uh, but I would say at the doors, I heard a lot of folks that weren't really pleased with Trudeau either. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, you know, I think for some people that would have made a real difference and, and for others it may not have. Um, but the absence was noticeable for those who cared. Hmm. And, and I think that spoke volumes. Lee, I know on election night, Dwight Duncan, a former Deputy Premier of Ontario, said that when he was canvassing in Windsor, and his old liberal riding in Windsor went conservative, this is Windsor mm -hmm. Tecumseh, mm -hmm. he said he was picking up huge anti-Trudeau sentiment at the door. Mm -hmm. So would you have wanted the Prime Minister to come out and help you? Well, I guess, I mean, I want to first of all say my local MP, uh, James Maloney, was a huge support uh, to our campaign through the campaign. So I, I want to call that out because I think it's really important. And he's got a great relationship uh, with the constituents in our riding. And certainly as a new candidate, he also offered a lot of advice to me. So, you know, I really appreciated that. I do think, like, as we saw on so many issues, I think listening to people at the doors is one of the most important gifts of an election period. Mm -hmm actually. And certainly it's clear there are federal issues that people are concerned about. There's provincial issues that people are concerned about. The two get blurred quite a lot. Um, and so I, I just ensured that we made sure anything we were hearing that would be a benefit to the federal government to hear, I made sure that we fed all of that back. Hmm. Jeff, what did you think when you saw Doug Ford and Justin Trudeau, bosom buddies in Windsor, days before the writ were, were, writs were drawn up? Well, I, I think it did speak to a challenge that our party faced, the Ontario Liberal Party faced in the election. That was our sort of economic bona fides were weak. Uh, and that probably reinforced uh, the economic bona fides and the, uh, the sort of good governance um, relationship between the uh, Ford government the, and the Trudeau government. That's something that's going to be hugely important for our party going forward. Uh, I think early in our campaign, despite those announcements, uh, we were rolling out, um, I think, of the uh, corporate income tax cut for businesses affected by the pandemic, some good economic policy. Uh, but that was lacking overall in our platform and overall in the campaign. And I think we gave that ground to the Ford government when Liberals traditionally have always been able to claim some of that. Would you think when you saw the PM and the Premier arm in arm in Windsor? I mean... 
I think the prime minister was doing his job as prime minister. His job is to lead the country. So there is some, certainly some discussion to be had there. And so that's that's part of his job is to work with whoever the premiers are. Um, I don't know about the timing. Uh, <laughs> but, By uh, saying that, you do know about the timing. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes, fair. Mm -hmm. um, but I did find it interesting how often the prime minister did come up at the door. And that's, you know, I've been knocking on doors for the last year and on the phone for six months before that because we couldn't knock on doors during the pandemic. And... Um, you know, it, it, it was a constant conversation and sometimes uh, sometimes to our benefit and sometimes there were people who um, were going to make their decisions about how they were going to vote provincially based on how they were feeling federally. And, um, you know, it's, I, I think it's it's hard to say whether it would have helped us or, or maybe not have been to our benefit to have, I don't know, more more partnership there. Gotcha. Let's um, let's bring this up. You guys have seen these numbers before, but they're amazingly close, so I want to bring them up again. Sheldon, can we do this, please? This is what happened on election night between the so-called progressive parties, the mm -hmm. New Democrats and the Liberals. The NDP got 31 seats on the basis of 1,098,646 votes, which works out to 23.73% of the total votes cast. Hmm. How did the Liberals do? Liberals got eight seats with more votes, 1.1 million plus votes, for a percentage of 23.76. 23.76 versus 23.73, and yet what a seat differential. Obviously, the New Democrats have a much more efficient vote than the Liberals have. Some people have, and I see Greg Cerbera, the former finance minister of Ontario, is out there already saying, it's silly for your, your two parties to be competing against each other. You should form a merger and create the Liberal Democratic Party of Ontario, and that's the way forward to ensure the anti-conservative vote doesn't get split. Nate, start us off. Good or bad idea? I think it's ultimately a distraction. I dropped my five-year-old off at of school this morning, and the crossing guard is a longtime liberal, and I asked him, and he said, no! And this is someone who <laughs> voted NDP in this past election. Someone who said, no, we need a strong liberal party. We need a liberal party to go back to its grassroots and, and renew at the membership level. And frankly, we need a liberal party that is going to, yes, be cooperative with the NDP, but is going to be a, a distinct entity. Lee, what about merger talks? What do you think? I think that it's going to be really important for us to reflect on everything that happened. I mean, even this, like, there was a lot of close races and kind of where we got to. I think about my own riding. We have over 17,000 people that voted Liberal in that riding. And I think that, to me, you know, I don't think that it, the, the instant thing has to be let's merge. I think we need to be thoughtful about this. I think that we need to think about what are people looking for from the Liberal Party. I think that I'm very proud of the fact that we put a plan out and we put out a costed plan. And when we stuck to understanding how we were going to achieve all that and explaining how we were going to finance it too, it resonated for people. And I think that's where people expect the Liberals to be. And I think that's an area that we need to really, really emphasize again as we move ahead. Um, you know, I've been an athlete in my past. I've, uh, I've lost really badly on the field to uh, the New Zealand All Black women who are a phenomenal team. You get yourself back up, you get ready to go back on for the next game, you learn from the game, you adjust, and, you, and then you decide where you go. I don't think that you sort of get up and say, oh, that's it, we've got to disband the team. I think you get back up and you say, okay, where are we going to go? How are we going to best serve people? And, and I would like us to do that through a pretty thoughtful process. And I think in our riding, again, um, you know, I think we have a lot of Liberals there. And they, they want to see us sort of in that spot that, that they know the Liberals should be. I'm trying to get over the notion of you being a rugby player back in the day. Because you're, you're, how tall are you? Six feet. I yeah. would not have wanted to meet you on the field. I bet you were tough. My I teammates bet. told me I was far too nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'd help the opposition up. <laughs> uh, okay, Jeff, merger talks. What do you think? Absolutely not. Canada and Ontario need a strong centrist party. The Liberal Party has always represented the core values of Canadians and Ontarians. Social progress, fiscal responsibility. And if we want, a, we live in very polarized times. I mean, look at what's happened in the U.S. with a two-party system. Deadlock, uh, terrible quality of political debate, decline in public debate, decline in turnout. I believe... Uh, that a strong Liberal Party is the best counter to that. It's good for the country, it's good for the province. Um, I, I do believe uh, we've gotten away from that as a party, and so our challenge now is to restore 
Ontarians' faith uh, in that centrism, in that fiscal responsibility, to be able to speak to the importance of the economy as we speak to the importance of social progress. Any appetite for you for a merger? No, and I think we need to be mindful that we can't necessarily mm -hmm. count on taking two and two and making four here. Mm -hmm. um, we can't yeah. expect that everyone who votes NDP would vote Liberal and everyone who votes Liberal would vote NDP. So I think it's you know, there's this idea that, okay, well, anyone who just doesn't want the Conservatives would come together and join us in this effort, and and then we would just win. And that's, I think, not the case. I mean, I, I've knocked on, uh, I knocked through my entire riding uh, at least twice, three or four times in some parts of the mm -hmm. of the community. And, you know, I heard from people who said, well, I would, I would absolutely never vote NDP, or I'd absolutely never vote Liberal. It's just who I am. This is how I vote. This is what I believe in. And there are definitely parts of our two parties that people feel uh, distinctly strong about, and they're not going to to move over with us just because we decide, well, we're going to come together because we think this is the best for the math. That is definitely the case in Mississauga Streetsville. Absolutely. It is definitely not the case in University <laughs> Rosedale, right? There, I mean, NDP yeah. came first, Liberals came second. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is there an appetite, do you think, certainly in some of those inner city ridings, for a merger? So I'm new to partisan politics. Uh, for me, it would be a hard no uh, for many of the reasons that Jeff talked about. I, I joined the Liberal Party because I believed in the principles of having a strong centrist Liberal Party for Ontario. And not just so we can win, right. but because we actually believe that those policies are what's going to grow the economy in a sustainable and inclusive way, that it will help people succeed, but also protect the most vulnerable, right? I mean, that's why someone like me decided to join that party. Not just, you know, as a sort of pragmatic, this is how we win. And so... You do have to win at the end of the day, though. You, well, if you want to do all that stuff, you, you got to win. You do have to win at the end. What I find interesting is in the riding, so many people who actually said you should join together and, and merge as parties were also very against our proposal for ranked ballots, <laughs> right? Which okay. would have actually mm -hmm. helped deliver a much uh, different result. Than, than we had. And so, you know, I think we have other options about how we can move forward that doesn't look at merging what are, in essence, two fundamentally different belief systems about how this province is going to succeed and how the people in this province are going to be able to get ahead and feel like their life is better than it was. I'm going to pursue some of those other ideas in a second. But, Nate, I want to bring you back in on this. I, in my travels, I found a lot of people who see the Liberals and New Democrats these days as being virtually indistinguishable. They're both, in the judgment of many, very far away from the center of political gravity in the province right now, way to the left. And beyond that, they see the supply and confidence agreement made by the federal Liberal Party and the federal New Democratic Party, and they see them getting along like kissing cousins in Ottawa so well, that they ask themselves, if these parties are essentially indistinguishable today, why not? And I would say they certainly aren't indistinguishable. And a couple of things around the similarities, because some people perceive a move to the left. And I can tell you from speaking to people who are disenchanted with the politics of today in Ontario, they certainly saw the NDP move to the center and they didn't vote for that reason, right? So I think there's a battleground around the center at the same time. And does a merger make sense? I think no. Does electoral reform make sense? I think a good deal when you look at the numbers that you put up mm -hmm. there. And in the, in the federal context, I would say two things. One, we still get heat from the NDP and they still tear a strip of us, uh, off of us every once in a while in question period because there are core disagreements. Certainly when we looked at the defense spending that we put forward in the budget recently, there were disagreements. And th there will continue to be core disagreements. And, and for me, uh, why I ran as a liberal, ultimately, there's a, I think, a more seri a serious approach to fiscal responsibility and to making sure that the math works. And I support many of the ideas that come from my colleagues from the NDP, but the math doesn't always add up. And so I, I think we do have to be cooperative. We don't, we don't have to find shared priorities and work together, but we aren't always going to be on the same page. And I would also caution when we talk about a merger and when I see the marriage of inconvenience that is the federal conservative party right mm -hmm. now, uh, you, you might have a merger that pays off in a short-term way but is destructive in a long-term way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Point. You mentioned proportional representation there, or at least alluded to that. I, I must have had 100 emails from people saying, you know, this is why we need PR, because obviously all this progressive vote counts for not if it's split. Except that, you know, 
It was rejected in this province in 2007 in a referendum, and the prime minister of the day has made it abundantly clear he's not going to bring it in, and we know Doug Ford's not going to bring it in either. Mm -hmm. Jeff, question. That's a non-starter, isn't it? Uh, PR. PR? Uh, well, we, camp you know, we campaigned on, on the belief in it. Um, I, I think we have to accept that we're going to fight the next election under the uh, current system. Uh, and we have to make our case uh, uh, we, as a party to, to the public that um, within the current system, uh, we are capable of, of governing on a broad agenda. I mean, I think, uh, you know, within the current system, uh, you talked about the, the vote efficiency of the NDP. Um, the winning math is different. And it is unfortunate because I think as vote, uh, you know, we are facing today a real crisis of disenchantment, of mm -hmm. declining turnout. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the, the more interesting question would be, do people, are people not voting because they think their vote doesn't matter? Or are they, think they're, are they not voting because they think politicians aren't relevant to them anymore. Politics isn't relevant to them anymore. I think you've got to get to the bottom of that question before you say, mm, it's a problem with the system. Of course there are problems with the system. I, I would agree. Look at the numbers you just showed on the screen. Uh, but I think there's maybe a more fundamental problem right now in terms of the way politicians speak to and listen to the public. Okay, well, let me try another idea then. Andrea talked about other ideas. How about this? In your two writings, the Liberals came second. So you should form an agreement with the NDP that you get dibs on those writings mm -hmm. and the NDP won't run a candidate. In your writing, because the NDP won, they get to run a candidate, you don't. And that way there's a non-aggression pact between Liberals and New Democrats, one candidate per writing. I see all of you looking very skeptical right yeah. now. Is this possible? Well, I can answer for our writing where mm -hmm. they... PCs haven't been elected in 42 years, and so the choice that voters had wasn't <clears throat> about voting PC or, or not voting so it wouldn't PC. Work so in it's, your a, mind. it's a very different calculus. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that you know we as liberals didn't show up to offer a picture of the future that was radically different than the New Democrats were, and they had a popular candidate that people liked, that I liked, Jessica Bell. Right. And so, you know, when you're out there at the door and you're trying to sell people on, you know, the liberals are the great savior against Doug Ford, and they're looking around saying, I'm not sure I'm buying it, right? And I don't, I don't see that as being true. I don't actually really understand what your purpose is here. Like, what's the value proposition that you're mm -hmm. offering that the incumbent's not offering? And so it was like really, really challenging at the door. I mean, we do need to get this right. I think that there are, there, as you know, I think Jill and others have said, there are voters for whom they would always vote liberal no matter who the candidate is. Mm -hmm. And same for, I, I think, all of the parties, and we saw that. But there's a great many. I mean, in University of Rosedale in September, uh, 20,000 people voted for Christian Freeland and 10,000 voted for me. So where did, the where did, 10 the, go? Where did yeah. those 10,000 people <laughs> yeah. go? What's the answer? I don't, well, I think, you know, Jeff spoke to a lot of those things and we, you know, we, we're sort of, I, I think there's a number of people that are seeking solutions without fully understanding the problem, hmm. right? And so we do understand there's poor turnout and there's voter apathy. Why is that? Hmm. It's not all the Liberals' fault. Some of it is, but not all of it. Um, and so, you know, I think there's, there's a number of questions that need to be asked about how do we strengthen our democracy? Because as we've seen from conflict and, and chaos in the rest of the world and, and in other parts that this matters. You know, democracy really, really matters and we should cherish it. And if we don't, we need to really question why. But I am betting, Lee, at some point on election night, you said to yourself, if only there had not been an NDP candidate in my <laughs> riding, <laughs> I'd have won. <laughs> and I bet Jeff said the same thing. If only there hadn't been an NDP candidate in my riding, you'd have won. Sure. So can you make an agreement that the Liberals will stand down in some ridings and the New Democrats should stand down in other ridings, and that way it's a one-on-one -on -one fight instead of a one-against-three fight? Well, I think, I mean, from what I heard at the door, there, there's no question people were making those choices, actually. So what, what was very clear at a lot of doors was, I'm certain I don't want the Conservatives. That was something I heard an awful lot, actually. I'm certain I don't want the Conservatives. Talk to me about which way is more likely to get us to an outcome that will, will overturn this chair. So that, that was a common sentiment. I, I certainly know there is a base in our riding that is NDP and that they were gonna they were gonna vote NDP no matter what. It's always and the I smallest base. Important. It's always come it yeah, almost it's, always it's, comes third. Yeah, exactly. And so I do think that um, like for example, some of the campaigns that came to bear, you know, and came a bit stronger near the end of the campaign, like the not one seat campaigns, et cetera, they were trying to be a source for people that were looking to to kind of get to that outcome. I think that, you know, I, I, I kind of agree with Jeff. Like, there's, 
There are the current rules of the game. I think that I heard from a lot of people at the doors, too. Like, let's really get serious about some kind of electoral mm. reform. I think people are hungry for it. Like, I'd be curious, you know, what would happen? Yes, you, you said that we talked about it in 2007. I'd love to talk about it again, quite honestly, mm. because it came up a lot, quite a lot, mm. and more than, I, more than I maybe even anticipated. But at the end of the day, like we need to make that compelling case for people. Mm -hmm. And and I think that it, it includes all sorts of factors, right, for, for what would be most compelling. And, and we need to get there for the next election under the current rules. Well, OK, <laughs> Nate, we're open to some ideas here. If a merger, a formal merger between the two parties is not on, if a non-aggression pact, the way I've described it, is not on, what then? Well, I. I do favor some kind of electoral reform in the long term, but I would say in this past election, many people who are not particularly partisan would have liked to have seen in very close ridings some kind of stand down to make sure that we didn't have a Ford majority that doesn't represent Ontarians in, in, in the way that they, they ought to. And doesn't bring the competence to the government that, that they ought to. I think we have to, looking ahead, we have to have a, a leader that resonates with Ontarians. We have to have a set of ideas where we go back to a, a serious policy renewal process and renew the grassroots and make it about riding associations, make it about mm -hmm. active participation and remind members of the Liberal Party and Ontarians more broadly that you might not like partisan politics at all times, but the answer is participation. And you got to show up, you got to take out a membership, and you got to get involved and add your ideas to the process. I think there has to be a really serious renewal, and, and you build from there. I wonder, Jill, if part of the issue here around turnout, certainly, was you had pollsters, you had media, you had lots of people in politics for the last six months basically saying this election's over before it's began, giving people the impression that why bother voting? Ford's victory is a preordained outcome. Was that a factor? I don't think it helped. I mean, I was certainly hearing it at the doors, and especially as we got closer towards the end of the election, it, it did feel like people felt that it was a foregone conclusion. So um, as much as there had been a lot of enthusiasm, uh, especially in the earlier part of the election, people really did feel like it was over before it started. And that's that's a much harder election to fight when you're going out there and saying, look, we, we have a case to make change here and to make sure that we're doing better for your family. And, and like, look how hard this last four years has been. And it doesn't have to be this bad. It doesn't have to be this way. We can actually Actually choose different going forward for the next four years but people really did seem to feel resigned to what the outcome was going to be before most of it before any ballots have been cast and that's really tough to overcome Jeff let me get some new ideas from you if it's not a merger if it's not a non-aggression pact <laughs> we're not going to change the electoral system before right. the next election what then yeah uh, two things one, and I talked about this before, I, I believe the party needs to return to its roots. This is a party that uh, reflected the values of Canadians so well for 100 years in the 20th century that it was called the natural governing party, it was sort of an arrogant That was the phrase. federal party, though. That was the federal party. But in, uh, in Ontario as well, we have seen a true centrist Ontario Liberal Party successfully appeal to a broad-based constituency. And I think you uh, diagnosed the problem correctly. Uh, we're sort of fighting over the centre-left at the moment because the NDP have moved in and we've moved over and uh, and and we need to um, re-establish uh, our our economic bona fides our our belief that uh, our Ontarians belief uh, that the Liberal Party can manage the economy can deliver jobs uh, can do it in a fiscally responsible way but be that party of reform the second thing I would say is see we have to change the way we talk to the public we, uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, in this campaign, a little bit engaged again in the, in the sort of gimmickry. Um, and we use language when we talk about important things like the affordability crisis. People don't sit at Tim Hortons and say, I feel like I'm in the midst of an affordability crisis. <laughs> they say, look at the price of gas. Holy crap, my kid can't afford rent. We need to change the way we talk to politicians, especially in an age where so much more political discourse is, is occurring unfiltered with all the challenges that that creates through social media. And uh, you don't, uh, it, that doesn't mean dumbing it down. It means being compelling about ideas and, and listening to people, talking that, to them in the way they talk to one another. Is that to say you were not a fan of calling it Buck Ride Province-wide? Oh, uh, you know what? <laughs> I, the, but there the, the name was an intentional <clears throat> contrast. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm -hmm. that point was pretty obvious to folks. Um, and I, I actually think that was excellent policy, but yeah, maybe it was presented a little gimmicky. And there were, there were a few other things that, that in retrospect, I, I, I wish we'd communicated differently because there was good policy underneath them. There were great ideas underneath them. 
Um, and uh, I do think that the, that age of politics is, uh, it has passed. Uh, and we, we are going to have to fundamentally sort of rethink how we communicate these ideas to people. Andrea, I don't want to get too poly sci 101 here, but the reality <laughs> is, I'm, but I'm hearing at least two of you here saying yeah. that the Liberal Party needs to get back to its roots and stop being a far left party and start being more of a moderate activist middle party. And yet, Doug Ford lives there now. Yeah. He's taken that place on the political spectrum away from you. And how do you imagine getting it back? Because he's planted his flag there right now, and people seem, a great chunk of people seem very comfortable to have the PC party there now. Yeah, I think he's definitely tried to plant it there. I would disagree that he's planted in the same place that the liberals would plant it. Um, and so I think he's definitely sold people that he is a good steward of the economy and can help with the growth of his province and deal with the uh, affordability <laughs> crisis or helping to, to, yeah. to, you know, buy Tim Hortons. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of good ideas that have been floating around in the past several days. And, you know, your question, are we in a crisis? You know, we have four years to actually to dive a little deeper on the diagnostics, mm -hmm. you know, to figure this out, to not rush, to actually start with what is our purpose and for whom? You know, who is it that we are trying to help and, and what is our theory on the best way to do that. And then we can move to what the brand is. Because I agree with Jeff, you know, we, I think we had a lot of tactics in the campaign and a lot of branding, but it wasn't necessarily tied to a narrative that people could really get that spoke to them and that they felt that they were a part of. And so that work takes time. I mean, you know, there's been, I've been a you know, CEO in many organizations. And if you need to do a strategy, you have to first really do the work of understanding the context that we're in. And we're in a really different environment right now. People feel very differently about life, about politics. We have massive demographic shifts and urbanization and migration, and that changes the calculus. Hmm. And we haven't really adapted to that well enough. And so, you know, my advice is let's do the work on that. I do believe that, you know, there is a purpose and it might be towards the center, but that's me. Other people may disagree. That's the beauty of having that dialogue. And as Nate said, you know, start at the grassroots. Let people engage in that process so they feel like they're a part of it. Well, you have nicely led us to where we need to go next, which is to figure out the way forward for the Liberals. And I'm hearing two conflicting things. I'm hearing what you've said. You're not an official party at Queen's Park. Take the time to do the work. Have a leadership convention two and a half, three years down the road. Uh, I've also heard the other side of the coin, which is if you hope to raise any money, if you hope to attract any decent candidates next time, you need to go fast and hard and get somebody new in place who can have some time in politics, in the legislature, in order to get better at what they need to get better at. So there's the debate. I want to find out where you folks are on the debate. Jill, what should the party do now? Well, that's, I mean, that's just such a massive question. Um, <laughs> no, in terms of, in terms of uh, like, let's start like, what, with timing of the leadership convention. Oh, you need a new leader. When before, should that happen? Before we, before we decide who the new leader is going to be, I think we did have to decide how we're going to choose our, our next leader. Um, so what we have previously done is delegated conventions, and I think it is time to review that question. We last did that in 2019 at our AGM. And, um, and at that point, the party voted to stick with delegated conventions, but it was a pretty close vote. And I think that... I think actually the majority voted for for one member, one vote. But, but it, we needed a super majority, hit, right, so it just missed it. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I think that now that conversation's coming back up, and it seems that there's more of an appetite for either a one member, one vote or a weighted one member, one vote. So we'll see mm. how that kind of pans out in the months ahead. Um, but yeah, I, I think we need to make sure that we're doing a good job of making sure that this process is more inclusive for Ontarians. Um, I think of one of the members of my team. Uh, she had been asked to run as a delegate in the last leadership convention um, for one of the candidates. And for her, that process just seemed really intimidating. She just thought, well, that seems very uh, inside for me. I don't really understand the process. And she didn't really know how to be involved at that level. So she turned it down. And she is now my riding president. And she volunteers 30 hours a week for me. So she's someone who is probably one of the most involved people that you could find. But she didn't really understand the delegate process or how we would go about doing any of that. And I think if we want to make sure that we're going forward in a way that's going to uh, choose a leader that works, that I think that attracts more Ontario is that we're speaking to uh, the general population and not just people who have been involved with the party for years and who, who I think, you know, 
know Stephen and love Stephen and have known who he is for a long time. And so he made sense for people who've been involved in the party. Um, but, you know, Ontario as a whole didn't get to know him the same way. Um, I think we need to make sure that we're making it as inclusive as possible so people have a chance to weigh in and get to feel like they're involved and have ownership over where we're moving as a party when it okay. comes to choosing the leader. Jeff, a leadership convention sooner or later? Uh, I, I think a little bit later. I think we need to do some listening first. And I really agree with Jill. You know, as mayor, one of the things I do is these town halls and we move them around the city and we intentionally do them out in neighborhoods and community you say, centers. You're the mayor of Barry still. I am. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm back to my old job. Hey. Uh, but you know what? I, I'm delighted to have five more months to do that job and I, and I hope to still make an impact on many of the things that I talked about during the provincial election. But I, I, I think that listening exercise, Jill, is so right. It can't just be an internal listening exercise. In fact, it must not be. Yeah. It must be an engagement with Ontarians in all parts of the province. I, I think, again, the geography of that engagement becomes essential uh, because you will hear quite a different answer with people who are experiencing uh, challenges differently in different parts of the province. And uh, that, I think, can also help with us understanding the way people talk about politics these days and, and how uh, we can uh, phrase our own ideas or frame our own ideas. So you, I, I think you start with that, that listening exercise and, and a bit of policy work and then, and then move along. And I, I agree with Andrew. I mean, four years is actually a long time. Uh, I'm not sure you wait two, two and a half or three years uh, mm -hmm. to do that, uh, do a leadership convention, because you do need some runway, as you say. Uh, but the first thing we need to do is, is sit back and consider um, where we sit as a, prob or a party and, and um, what we stand for and listen to the way people are talking today okay. about politics and issues. Down to our last few minutes, I want to make sure I get everybody in on this. Lee, a leadership convention sooner or later? Yeah, I, I'm inclined to say at least a little later and I definitely, I feel the same. I want, we've got such great engagement right now coming off this. Mm. You know, we, we did have a lot of involvement and I think people are feeling already the day after the election got so many messages saying, I want to know how I can continue to contribute between now and the next election. Mm -hmm. So that's great. We need to really, uh, I think that we really need to capitalize that. And so I, and I would just wait a little. The other thing I would say for our, our congratulations to our colleagues that are going to be uh, in the legislature, um, they've got a big job. Like we need to hold Doug Ford accountable. Um, you know, I think for me, where I'm a little worried is that, you know, the fact that people didn't show up during the election, didn't show up to debates, are, there isn't a, a transparency, the mandate letters are still not transparent. All these issues, to me, get to the core of being good governors and being, you know, really engaging with the public. So I think that work needs to happen by a, a, an interim leader at a minimum at that level, and then we need to have this broad engagement. Andrea, same to you. Yeah, I love this idea that there's this like, you know, shining vision that's going to save the Liberal Party, but I, I try not to indulge in magical thinking. You know, we're really at risk of being three strikes, you're out if we don't get this right. 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 And so this is worth doing well. And in most companies, you do a job description first before you go and hire your leader. And I think we need to do that basic work because a leader is not just a figurehead. It's someone who can build the grassroots like we've talked about, who can, you know, attract donations, who can set the way forward and get that energy and enthusiasm. And I am super excited with the prospect of being able to deliver that for 2026 because that's what we need. But we're not going to do it in the next year. Well, I got a different question for you. You won't be shocked to hear. <laughs> Are you the shining vision she just referred to? You want this job? I'm, I honestly, I, I am thinking about it. I have talked about it a little bit with family and that's the most important thing is to figure out if it makes sense for family with two young kids and with a, an incredibly busy wife. And so I'm, I'm thinking about it and I, I think there's a really interesting opportunity to shape the party and grow a party and, and rebuild the party. And I think we've got to learn some lessons in respect of going back to the grassroots. I think we've got to learn some lessons too. This past election, I don't think we framed the conversation around competence. I don't think we explained to Ontarians that we were ready to deliver a smart, fair and honest government in a way that, that I think we were, were ready to and, and we need to be ready to. And with respect to the leadership race, I, I hope lots of people enter the race. And so I hope it's an extended timeline because I think we have to learn the lessons of our own failings in the last round. It was an expedited race. It pushed people out and we're worse off because of it. And so whatever I want to do, I think we want a, a really healthy race with lots of people involved. Mm -hmm. Time prohibits me from asking the six follow-up questions that I would normally <laughs> ask. So I won't do that, but I will share this tweet. 
Sheldon, you want to bring this up? We're at the bottom of page five here, and um, there's the oh. bear of Barry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the four nicest words one can hear after a devastating loss on election night are, good morning, your worship. <laughs> Jeff Lehman was back on the job the morning after. There he is at his Great. desk. He's still the mayor of Barrie until October. And then, and then what, Jeff? Uh, well, we'll see. Um, I have a little bit of time to consider that. And, and Nate's absolutely right. Hmm. That's uh, at this point after two years of a pandemic, for me, two years of a pandemic in a leadership role, a tornado, uh, and then uh, the tornado of an election. Hmm. Um, I, I, I don't mind having a few summer months to think about the future. Um, but uh, I, I said on election night, I'm not done. Uh, I am certainly not done contributing, and I don't think I'm done in public life. Good. And you're running for school board. I am. Yeah, I'm running for trustee in Mississauga. Okay. Yeah. Lots of defeated candidates did that four years ago, and most <laughs> of them won. And what about you? Well, I've, uh, you know, as people know, I was uh, just over six weeks ago the president of yeah. a hospital, yeah. and I've stepped into this uh, into this campaign. So right now I'm going to take a holiday, something I've not had uh, for the last several years. It's been That's intense. Okay, we'll you need a job there. too. I need a job too. Yeah, you're hiring. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank all of you for making, uh, especially in the case of His Worship, a very long drive to be with us here today. <laughs> so nice wide shot, Sheldon, if you would, and we'll thank all of our guests all at once. Thanks for coming into TVO tonight. It's been great having real people back in the studio again. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. As most of us try to put COVID-19 in the rearview mirror, the arrival of some new contagion is the last thing anyone wants. Then along comes monkeypox. So let's find out what risks it poses. Joining us now in Mississauga, Ontario, Dr. Zane Chagla. He is an infectious disease physician at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton and associate professor of medicine at McMaster University. Welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, I am not an infectious disease specialist, neither is the wider public, although many may think so after two years of a pandemic. So let's start with the basics. What is the monkeypox virus? So this is a DNA virus, very different than COVID-19. That's an RNA virus, um, and very closely related to the virus that causes smallpox within the same family. This has been described in the 1970s in, in monkeys, which is d derivative of the name, but more recently uh, has been shown to be circulating in rodents, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, West and Central Africa, where there's been sporadic cases and, and actually a significant rise in cases over the last 10 years uh, that have been largely from interactions with uh, with rodents in those communities and, and then coming back into households with limited spread. Um, there have been a few events of transmission that's occurred outside of uh, uh, West and Central Africa. There was an outbreak in 2003 associated with um, some rodents that were actually imported from the Gambia uh, and, and other West African nations. And then uh, more recently, we've seen a few events associated with travelers from an outbreak that's been occurring in Nigeria. Over the last month and a half, though, there has been now a new set of descriptions amongst individuals acquiring monkeypox without those epidemiologic and travel links to uh, Central and West Africa, which uh, has been actually the largest event that's occurred in, in, in history of, of monkeypox outside of those endemic settings. Do we have a, a sense of what sort of caused these most recent outbreaks in countries that, you know, uh, smallpox has been eradicated uh, for many years? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's unclear. Part of it and, and what's happening in West and Central Africa now is the, you know, so-called lack of immunity to smallpox, which is leading to a vulnerable population. And we see cases in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo higher than they've ever been before. Um, but, you know, there is probably some set of events that occurred um, either within West and Central Africa or, or with people from that region in another area of the world that then transmitted to a different network of individuals, which is now transmitting in other networks of individuals all over the world. 
And, you know, I think the other part is the recognition that this was, you know, something that was transmitted and, and you know, a number of individuals that were having atypical symptoms that didn't fit into a box um, now is starting to be recognized as people with monkeypox endemically uh, in places like Portugal, UK, the EU, Canada, and the United States, where uh, they may have been unfortunately attributed to other symptoms and, and, uh, and not necessarily treated as a monkeypox case. All right, so let's talk about transmission. You talk about travel. Uh, is this through contact? Is this airborne? How exactly can someone get monkeypox? Right now, you know, from what's described, most of the transmission is, is short range and really is intimate close contact. So skin to skin contact and, and contact with uh, open sores of of, uh, of individuals, uh, especially as they're going through that pox phase where, where the virus is, is incredibly present within those lesions. We do see respiratory spread and it is a potential mechanism. We see people in their respiratory tracts have virus. And so, you know, the droplet and aerosol spread is possible. Um, and uh, and certainly in healthcare settings, for example, it's it's a part of the way we manage cases in that sense. Um, but again, many of the cases we're seeing are people with very close and intimate contact with primary cases, suggesting that again that skin to skin or very very prolonged respiratory contact are are the the ma major mechanisms of spread here. Uh, you talked about the open sores. Uh, what other symptoms should people be looking out for that uh, would help? identify that to uh, to monkey box. So uh, the uh, incubation period, so after being exposed to develop symptoms, is about five to up to 20 days, most people within a week or two. Um, there's about one to five days of just feeling unwell, flu-like, you know, could be mixed up with another infection. Uh, and then there's the appearance of the characteristic rash. And so uh, these often start out kind of as, as flat red areas that then start getting raised and then fluid filled and, and turn into kind of uh, pustules, which then um, cause ulcerations in the skin. These can be anywhere over the body, you know, the typical classic descriptions from West and Central Africa are the face and then involving the trunk uh, afterwards. But certainly in this uh, this set of individuals that we're seeing, um, the genital areas, so in the mouth, uh, around the lips, uh, around the, the penis and around uh, other genital areas have been also described uh, and actually quite predominant among some of the individuals that have been described. All right, I want to talk about treatment uh, and the tools at our disposal, a little bit different of course, than COVID-19 because we had to act fast. Uh, I understand with smallpox vaccine, there is, you know, there, there is some research there and there's some ways to tackle it. Uh, what, what are the sort of approaches there? Yeah. So number one, you know, because a lot of people are, are symptomatic, uh, and so it, and it's you know a little bit easier to identify cases as compared to COVID-19. Um, case and contact management is still a really appropriate intervention. That if you find cases, you look back at their contacts, you're able to isolate contacts. Uh, you can largely limit spread in in that context. The fact that we have vaccines, and so uh, smallpox vaccines, again, smallpox vaccines are the oldest vaccines that we have. In fact, the prototype for vaccines, the word vaccinia comes from cowpox, which is uh, the derivative of vaccine. Um, but uh, but with the newer generations of smallpox vaccines, which are much you know uh, easy to acquire and, and easier to administer, uh, could be given to individuals after exposure, which then may reduce spread ongoing to, to further individuals and so-called ring vaccines vaccination to make sure that the contacts of a case are immune and, and are less likely to transmit outside of that uh, and also can be used in higher risk individuals like healthcare workers, those who work in the lab, etc. And then there is a treatment available, a drug called Ticorvimab or Mpox, uh, or sorry, Tpox, um, which uh, which has effects on, on smallpox, which likely has in vitro effects on monkeypox. Um, but thankfully, again, you know, the vast majority of cases that are being described in this new outbreak that's been seen over the last month and a half have been mild with very, very few requiring hospitalizations, even those, you know, mainly for social reasons or to get to a diagnosis a bit quicker. Is it fair to say that this is not a deadly strain uh, of monkeypox? 
Yeah, the, the clade that's been uh, noticed here uh, it genetically is l linked to the West African clade, which you know had a mortality rate of three uh, percent, which was described in West Africa. Now, you know, we have to take that very differently in the context of a, of what's happening now. You know, the descriptions in West Africa were also of people that uh, you know didn't necessarily seek medical attention, with high levels of malnutrition, with high levels of uh, poorly treated chronic diseases, high levels of HIV. Uh, and so mortalities may appear higher. Again, the global experience we've had now of nearly 1,300 cases being described to this point, you know, the vast majority have had outcomes where they've never needed to be hospitalized or hospitalization has only been a part of just making the diagnosis or helping with isolation, which, you know, hopefully pretends to a fairly good prognosis in most individuals and, and, uh, and again, largely a disease that will likely be outside of hospitals than within hospitals. All right. So let's talk about the numbers here in Canada a disproportionate number of cases of monkeypox have shown up in gay and bisexual men, as well as men who have sex with men. Do we have a sense of why that is the case? Yeah, it's not totally clear. Uh, this may be dealing with the networks of people that were first a part of that whatever event occurred that that led to transmission outside of uh, of West and Central Africa. Um, uh, there is some data coming out from Euro surveillance. Um, again, whether or not it's that close intimate contact that may occur during uh, uh, sex, or is it actually from body fluids? There's some data from Italy suggesting that um, male body fluids, for example, may, may also have uh, some degree of viral uh, uh, trans, uh, replication and, and we have seen this with other diseases like Zika and Ebola, where uh, genital fluids may also be a source of infection. Um, but, you know, certainly we have to recognize that it is within these networks. And part of the solutions for disease control are, you know, creating non-stigmatizing approaches, uh, really partnering with uh, organizations that represent these communities, providers that represent these communities, uh, and offering interventions as partnerships with these communities. Uh, not necessarily uh, excluding the uh, other communities from the need for diagnosis and monitoring, but really making sure that these communities are supported as part of their efforts to, to, to mitigate the disease. Let's, I want to pick up on that uh, notion of stigma. You know, monkey, monkeypox is very different from HIV and AIDS, uh, but as the headlines link the disease to outbreaks among men who have sex with men, are there bigger concerns that this community once again will be singled out and stigmatized? Yeah, I mean, hopefully, and, and there's been an incredible amount of progress from HIV in in, in these populations, right? And, and again, putting uh, gay and bi men who have sex with men uh, really upfront in advocacy, uh, really upfront in partnerships with the health community, um, you know, coming up with messaging that's non-stigmatizing, but also targeted towards communities uh, is still important, right? We can recognize that, that the highest risk community right now is gay and bi men who have sex with men, and we can provide partnerships in non-stigmatizing ways, advocate, give resources to those communities in order to make sure that men are educated and uh, have access to testing, uh, vaccinations, and other preventative efforts needed. Uh, you know, I, I think we, we've learned a lot from HIV to make sure that we can do this in a way that supports communities in a non-stigmatizing way, but it really, again, involves partnerships more than anything else. And these partnerships have to be in Toronto, but they have to be in, in smaller cities as well across the, the province and the country. Now, you've mentioned HIV. We've obviously learned from that. We've also learned from COVID-19 how fast we have to act. What lessons from this pandemic uh, can we apply to monkeypox? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with, with parallels to HIV, when it started showing up in, in North America, you know, there had been decades of transmission that had been occurring in sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, with COVID, you know, similarly, uh, you know, the, the, the burden of disease in the developing and low-income world um, was was directly correlated to this virus's evolution, its trajectory throughout the, the world. And so, you know, I think we have to recognize this is a global health uh, uh, threat. You know, the, the 
rise of infectious diseases with climate change, with populations that are encroaching in, in animal spaces more and more, and the fact that we're such a globalized population where someone can get on a flight anywhere around the world within 24 hours, you know, really makes us cognizant of our global health position and our need to support communities and surveillance and efforts. There's been ongoing transmission of monkeypox in Nigeria and in the Democratic Republic of Congo that's been unnoticed to the community uh, outside of those regions in the, in the Western world for years. And, you know, I think we are paying the price for this, right? We, we recognize there was an infectious disease threat that could have come on a plane any time over the last decade. Uh, but we're seeing what happens when it finally does make it out. And, and it may be, uh, you know, the people suffer from it. So, you know, part of our efforts moving forward outside of this pandemic is recognizing global health is a global community, is partnerships with high and low income countries, is supporting research and practice in high and low income countries, and that knowledge collaboration and knowledge partnership that we are a global community, that health across both animal and human species is important uh, and is going to be a very fundamental investment moving forward for, for the entirety of our world. Really great point, but I do have to ask this question. You know, it's been two years people have been living with COVID-19. You, you know, as a public, as an infectious disease specialist and working in public health, are you concerned at how receptive people will be and the public will be to having to deal with news about another, another virus? Yeah, I mean, look, we've had, in the last two decades, we've had SARS-CoV-1, we've had Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, we've had Zika, we've had Ebola, we've had uh, avian influenza or, or swine influenza in, in 20, uh, 2009, and we've had SARS-CoV-2. You know, this is not a pace that's slowing down, right? We are a globalized celestial society, and we have to embrace this. At the same time, I think this does start the discussion, and especially in dealing with COVID in the current day, about really making sure that positive, non-stigmatizing, non-discriminatory efforts are put forward first and foremost, and that we embrace communities in a positive public health approach. We need the public as a stakeholder uh, as we move forward in pandemics, this one and the next one and the next one after that. And we do have to think about the consequences of more punitive measures uh, as, as uh, you know, again, they may lose public trust as we need uh, the public back to help deal with uh, other emerging infectious disease threats. Dr. Zane Chagla, appreciate your insights. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. No problem. All the best. That is the agenda for Thursday, June 9th, 2022. London, Ontario marked a terrible anniversary this week, one year since the attack that killed four members of a Muslim family out for an evening stroll. Tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka finds out what we've learned since about confronting Islamophobia in this country. I'm Jane Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and Nam, we'll see you tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.